Welcome, everybody. Um, actually, the, the title that we had that I had in mind was sort of like, um, why is a down art market good? But that was three or four months ago, so they didn't want any negative terms in the title, so I think we have cultivation and risk in the title. But before we get to the topic, I'm Josh Baer. I'm an art advisor, and uh, I publish a newsletter called The Bear Facts. And we're honored to have Paul Schimmel here, who's been, um, up until recently, I would say, the greatest curator of contemporary art in, a, in the world, or at worst, tied for that. And it's interesting, all these years at MoCA, that now Paul's gone to the gallery world, because two years ago, I think, I sat on the stage with Jeffrey Deitch, who had just made the opposite switch from being a dealer for close to 30 years to becoming, you might have met him when he was the director at MoCA, I, I think. I, I met him when we both were like just the young kids on the block like yourself. We were, you know, 20 years old when we all met actually. We still, uh, we, we had hair. Yeah. So, um, Paul. Uh, He's still a dealer and I'm still a curator. That's, well, I think, uh, why don't you, that's kind of true. <laughs> Say something more about that. No, thanks. Okay, so. Um, maybe we'll start a little bit like our, at the art market. Th three to six months ago, everybody was freaking out. They thought, is the world going to end or not? And now it's six months later, and from the likes of what I've seen here and the last few months, maybe the topic was, you know, was there a down market? What, what does that even mean, an, an up or down art market, Paul? Does it mean anything to you? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I came in, into the art world, you're a little younger than me, but not unlike the same time because you, you're, you're an art brat, as self-described, and your mom, Joe Bear, was still, you know, came of age in the late 60s, 70s, at, at a time when uh, contemporary art was a, you know, a truly specialist area, and, and we were very, you know, l lucky in a way to come in to this kind of rarefied world where artists had, you know, exceedingly low expectations in terms of financial remuneration, and the opportunities as a critic or an art historian or writer in the area of contemporary art was, you know, small and, and, and rather narrow. Even even museums that specialized in, in living art, in some cases, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't let artists into, into, their, into their home, you know, into their place. And from the standpoint of then to now, uh, for me at least, the early 80s was really, you know, that was the game changer. I mean, that was the one where I went, whoa, there's actually people who are interested in contemporary art and there's a market because so much of the great material that I remember seeing in my early 20s, in, in, you know, coming into contact with uh, boys, and, you know, Rene Bloch bringing Eurasia to New York to try to sell to the Guggenheim for $25,000 and having it sit in downtown Manhattan for like two years, you know, and end up going back to Germany before it got sold back to MoMA 25 years later. Well, the world has completely and utterly changed. And well, we had a, we were fortunate, I think, that we were, uh, came of age in a golden era of art making. So, as a, No, this is the golden era of art making. So now we're in the golden era we of are. art making? Oh, we are. Or yeah, we are. And it's for so. sure. Because, as a kind of very narrow and specialist sort of area, without a, an audience, even within, you know, centers, New York or Los Angeles or London for sure. When I said this, this was not, people were not, um, the major movements, land art, earth art, conceptualism, minimalism, post-minimalism that came of age during the 70s were, you know, highly regarded among artists, but in fact, 
there really was no, no audience. And, 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 and in that respect, I think artists suffered terribly. I think the kind of encouragement uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and just basic support. I mean, to see Gordon Mata Clark having to come down to Houston to sort of whore around to try to find somebody to realize his piece is not like, you know, the golden age. Now, the golden age is now, and its, it's, it's, it's impact is global in a way that has fortunately followed, I think, uh, a, a, a very significant trend in terms of revisionist history that includes most notably contemporary movements, post-war movements in Asia, in Latin America, uh, Africa to some degree, but it is hugely global in a way that w really was unimaginable. But parenthetically, and maybe most importantly to the market, uh, you don't have things quite so supported and maybe nurtured and maybe even a way crushed on a regional level. You know, great artists came out of San Francisco. They maybe kind of loved them right like this. But now you have uh, collectors, institutions in some ways following those collectors' foundations uh, that are unimaginable in terms of number. The dispersity on a global level has no precedent in the history of art. And if you talk about golden age, you compare it to Holland in the 17th century, which was huge, an extraordinary period. Uh, and yes, there was global reach, but it was still a very kind of See, I think rich market. I think we're in the age of gold, but I'm not sure we're in the golden age. Um, would you extend that there's the artists under 35 making the work that I can name 20 artists that when I was 30, under 35, are even now considered important and serious? Are we, even though the art market is bigger, the art audience, which is the best part, is much bigger, and the art world and all the infrastructure is much bigger and stronger and more people can be supported, isn't that all ultimately based on the art itself and dependent on that? You know, again, you look at the, the history of art and, and, and during any period where there was you know, extraordinary excess wealth for a given period of time, you have a lot of uh, minor masters, genre artists, uh, artists that specialize in areas. And, and yet, quite often, I'm not saying the marketplace is right, but certainly history is right in that uh, artists are the ones who ultimately give value. We look back at our history, what's really meaningful for the next generation. And I am certain, given both the breadth, the wealth, and the uh, 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 extraordinary appreciation by uh, 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 such a wide audience that we live at a time when there are, I'm certain, far more artists uh, under 35 than there's probably been ever in the history of art. I'm not going to sit here and make a list of names. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of things that we see today and we've seen throughout our lives at any given point, you kind of go, really? And sometimes, you know, they are extraordinarily brilliant artists and sometimes they completely disappear. Yes, we do live in a time where maybe there's too much proximity between the market and the artists. And the history of art has never been that kind to those artists who get too close to their patron. Sometimes there are exceptions, but they're usually real motherfuckers who keep telling, you know, the rich guys to go away. Uh, yeah, you know, it worries me to see artists chasing around How, how many artists here. are in the room? I like to always understand who we're talking to. You're all to our left, that makes sense. That's good. Uh, Concentration on the left side. On the left that side for the sense. artists. And collectors. How many collectors? That'll probably be on the right side. Raise your hand if any. Okay, we're consistent. Um, people who are um, professionals who write about art. People who are gallerists. 
for work at galleries? They're in the booth, except you, you yeah, took okay. lunch People off. People who thought there was free food and came here by accident. That's important for us, I think, for me to try to understand, you know, who we're addressing our remarks to as to like, you know, so we have this huge global structure and the best part of that is? You know, uh, when I was starting out as an art historian, and I had a real interest, always in, in a sense, l overlooked or less appreciated art in the post-war era, and there's been so many things that uh, uh, came of, of, uh, uh, of interest to me. I mean, I did my master's thesis on Joan Mitchell at a time when Joan, this is in the late 70s, was just really kind of frankly happy to just beat Helen. <laughs> That's all. I mean, it was very kind of, it was a very kind of small world. So I, I mention that because I think the appreciation, value that we now apply, and this is a huge and broad specter of women artists, has been very significantly changed. Latin America, which was really in terms of how most of it was being dealt with was a kind of provincial offshoot. It was coming out of Europe in the 30s in the sense of its own history that really had developed in the 50s, 60s, 70s was all but invisible. When I first started looking at So is provincialism the, dead? Is that over? You know, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm a great booster of Los Angeles because it, at once it is a place that um, uh, uh, has remarkable regional qualities. And, and, and there is a difference between region, notion of regionalism or provincialism. It's both in tone, but in the history of art, you know, they call the American, you know, uh, the American uh, 30s, uh, they, they, were, they were, you know, regionalist, but... And a great, by the way, place to look at it shows that did that was with the Getty Initiative maybe four or five years ago. Pacific Standard Times, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in, in that respect, you know, what went on in Osaka in the early to late, I mean, from uh, throughout the 50s in terms of Gutai uh, you know, and its r relationship to, quote, the master narrative coming out of New York and, and Abex. This has changed things so fundamentally. And I think in some ways, as, as art and the history of art has really begun to look at uh, uh, the extraordinary contributions in Asia, and I think historically led by Japan in the post-war era, or Latin America, and, and, and again, out of Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, among others. From my standpoint, the West Coast, Los Angeles, which was seen as, again, one of these sort of uh, novelty specialty, you know, it, 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 it has so much more created a keel on a boat that Bruce, isn't like Bruce this, Nauman but like this. Used, arguably the greatest living American artist used to be thought of in New York as a Californian artist. And Bruce Nauman is the greatest uh, living uh, uh, California artist, I'm very happy <laughs> to say. And uh, it's only when New York started actually deluding itself into thinking he was one of theirs, but you know, he went to school in Davis, he spent time in San Francisco, had his breakthrough certainly in Los Angeles, and had a one-person exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Whitney while he was still in his late 20s. That's L.A. I mean, that, that, that's an L.A. artist. But that artist. used to be a uh, put-down at a point. Yeah, and so may, maybe, the, I mean, from that standpoint, uh, uh, that is arguably what we're seeing increasingly on a global level, and it has extraordinarily positive ramifications. So in terms of this title, we talk, the title talked about cultivation. How can anybody be sophisticated, cultivated, knowledgeable about Western art, Latin American art, Asian art, understand the historical implications of that cultural history, see how it relates to a global level. Me personally, I find it like, 
I like to be expert in things. So when I go Latin American, I go, oh my God, I really don't understand anything there. It's like, it's like Korean to me, but it's from Latin America. How sh can anybody, any of us, navigate this? It's, it's too much. You're able to, but... No, no, I, 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 I mean, firstly, I did one show where I really actually managed to, and, uh, to, to kind of try to pull it together, and I'll, I'll never have the enough brain cells or intelligence to try to do it again, but the Out of Action show where I was trying to sort of knit together performance-based objects, paintings, the relics, including Latin America, the United States, Europe, Japan, and, and I, it worked, I, I think, remarkably well because of a very narrow and disputed terrain of this notion of the objects and things that came out of performance. And so when you try to like tie all of this so world when, together, you have to kind of drill down so to a certain So when the museums kind of, take over that, that role of weeding out the thousands to the dozens to the few, does the market follow? I mean, I saw last year Jessica Morgan's show about pop art at the Tate that was based on the premise that all that stuff was going on around the rest of the world. And here it is, which was, I thought, an excellent idea. And then you get to the objects, and then I'm not so sure. Did the market pick up on those artists? Did anything happen, or was Look, it it's, just a it's, pure it's, academic? It may come as a shock to all of you uh, that museums, curators, maybe even least of all dealers, don't ultimately have uh, control of, of the market. It is truly what is relevant and important and meaningful for generations of artists that go forward. And, and, and the reason why we look at things today that were overlooked in the 60s uh, is because it has real value and real meaning for, t for, for what people are today. I thought you were going to say today. collectors were the ones that were going to decide. Uh, well, they may benefit, but I don't think they decide. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, look at it. It wasn't until Pollock started doing, you know, field paintings uh, that all of a sudden people would start looking at, you know, late Monet, which was considered, you know, the work of a sort of doddering and very blind artist who was had to paint a hundred feet from the thing. And then all of a sudden you start looking at, you know, the late, wa you know, water lilies and you, you kind of go, oh shit, it changed everything. And, uh, I, I, you know, artists do ultimately set the price. I, I, I hear from like, you know, auction house heads will say something like, oh, the market knows everything. Actually, the market knows nothing the history of what is made by artists that come from generation to generation forward. Look, P Picabia was rediscovered by, a, and you know this full well, by a generation that emerged in the 60s and without, let's say, Polka on one hand, or Kippenberger, or uh, Sally and Schnabel yeah. uh, on the other. Uh, uh, and, and yes, I know, you know dealers did work, and but Go see the Bacabia show. You look at it and you kind of go, oh, I get it. This guy completely, you know, upended the notion of a kind of a coherent oeuvre and, you know, reinvented himself in a very postmodernist way that, you know, a lot of people at the time thought was, you know, either nuts or fascist. It could have been both of those things. Sexist. But, uh, certainly. But, but, but it had extraordinary meaning for a generation of artists that Picabia could never have imagined at the time he did those works. So now, let's tie it back since my topics are always the market. I remember my mother tried to convince her ex-husband, my dad, to spend all his money buying Picabias in 1975, and he really didn't want to listen to his ex-wife give him advice about anything. Well, that's why they were divorced. She, that's why they were divorced. Because he was but, stupid. So none of us listened. <laughs> In, including my mom who had no money. So, um, so now the market is ready to take it, or, or it's still. You know? oh, look, at, I mean, the appreciation for Picabia when you compare it from the '70s to today. In the '70s, we know, relatively speaking, somebody like Duchamp was a giant and 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 and, and was underappreciated, but 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 there was a sense that. 
This was the master. Pacabia was like off in left field, you know. It was, you know, we're talking about a genre within the specialist, you know, area. And if it hadn't been for what happened from his art, it had a meaning and a resonance and a, and, and, and a veracity with all of its lies and untruthfulness that, you know, changed. Uh, 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 so is it useful to go back into the history and say, wow, the influence, this is a good example of Duchamp on contemporary art is pretty clear, Man Ray, go back to the 20s. And and if you want to make a historical say, play. The only ones that matter to, the mod, to contemporary art are Duchamp, Picabia, and Man Ray. And you look there, and you've done that, was there someone else? Do we go back and look and say, was there a fourth horseman then? And if so, that's where you should be brave enough to, as a dealer, a museum person, or a collector, or a critic, to write about? Yes. So go to the library? No, you, you go out and kind of see what artists, you, you can see them all upstairs uh, are doing. You kind of... See who uh, they're channeling. You, exactly. And, 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 and uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky sometimes the uh, uh, destroy the picture out of action. I mean, the destroy the picture, painting the void, you know, had, uh, you know, big groups of um, Shimamoto and Burry. And uh, uh, I mentioned these two only because uh, uh, I think those artists W which were extraordinarily successful in their own right in their own time, but when you look at the value that they have today versus what they had just a decade ago, it couldn't have been in a way imaginable without a whole generation of young abstract painters who are working today and who are maybe in some cases being disparaged with titles like, you know, zombie abstraction. Uh, but for them, looking at that work, those new materials, that kind of battle, made uh, it quite clear that, that these works that were made in the 50s and 60s... Okay, but that helps for value. looking back, but now, okay, you're a 30-year-old artist. That's, to me, the safest bet. You look at the, what the young guys are doing and you see how it changes if, the history if, of art. But if you're an artist here or you're a younger artist, it's like you're stuck with all this knowledge in there and you don't want to be seen as channeling soulage or all that, it's a completely opposite challenge to sort of create your own voice, isn't it? Isn't it sort of... I've always encouraged artists to steal and plunder to the, the ends of the earth. Don't from borrow, steal. Steal, plunder, whatever you want to call it. It, it, it. You'll know very quickly if you've made it your own, you know, as everyone looks at it and says, oh, gee, that looks like a fucking Picabia from 1927. You, you, didn't, you didn't own it. You didn't steal it. You hardly even borrowed it. But if you really steal it, you've done, you know, and, and uh, I've kind of over, I'm certainly over Andy Warhol at this point in my life. It's like, you know, I see way too many artists kind of going back in terms of, how they present themselves and, you know, the whole kind of conflation of lifestyle and popular culture and, and you know, totally sort of, you know, they did call him Andy Horhall for a reason. But then I, I went and saw that car crash yesterday over at the uh, Basel, the new wing at the Basel Art Museum. And it's, you know, just beautiful sort of stack black and white, you know, car cash repeated on the left, and on the right is like, Andy's just taking his f open fist and just shoving it into Ad Reinhardt's face and saying, fuck you, I could do this, I could, you know, just kind of like, you go, go, okay, he owned it. I mean, he, you know, he, 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 like he said, I could be a pop artist one day and an abstract expressionist the other. So when you take from the history of art, you, you got to kind of like, you know, you can't be nice. You have to really make it your own. Well, that's, I would find it very hard to be an artist now because, um, you know, when there was 200 of you in the world, um, all drinking at the same place, there was 
um, attention there that was pretty good. But you're, you're lucky. That, you, you, you grew up thinking there were 200, but you've gotten smart enough to know that there was 50 more over here and 30 over there and 50 over there. Doing the same thing in Venezuela and, and Not the Korea. same thing, but we just, we just know a lot yeah. more and there's just a lot more uh, good, good uh, uh, infrastructure in, the, in, 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 in museums, in foundations, in galleries, private collectors that are supporting an increasingly sort of rich and varied viewpoint that isn't quite as I, look, it's the nature of a museum person and a collector to think in terms of both hierarchy and quality. Th that, that goes without saying. But our notion of what the hierarchies are and how we evaluate quality is, is far more expansive. So, yeah, Do you find it, it's confusing, on the other hand, become a specialist. Well, as you sort of said before, are you finding that as a gallerist, Hauserworth and Schimmel, I should have said, only in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, that you think actually a little bit more like a curator now that you're a dealer, and you felt a little bit more like a dealer when you're trying to raise money and, and acquire art through collectors. At on a, a good day, yes. Uh, now and on a bad day, no. Before, but uh, I like know. it much better because now I can say. Paul, you know, since I have clients, I can say no to him in a way that was impossible to when he was in a museum. You know, there was, well, he, I miss that. He has to hear the word no occasionally was, was the only difference. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's an extraordinary time in that, uh, uh, look, at the history of galleries and museums is rather short and limited. It's, it's essentially a, a 19th century invention. And, you go back to what the museums were showing at the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, and you go and look at what Duran Ruel was doing when he did his big Manet exhibition, you know, like the 10 years he put together, getting those works together. You look at the list, the Metropolitan couldn't do the Manet show, and they wouldn't have done it, you know, at the Salon. In, 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 so the but right now you'd say, Manet, dude, we got Frankfurt Art Fair, got to have one. And by the way, Art Basel Miami Beach is coming up, get one there. We have two shows to do in L.A. Big get problem. Cracking. Huge and fucking Manet problem. And Manet would never make it. Vermeer no, wouldn't no, no, make no. it. Huge problem. And, and, and it's something I'm actually deeply concerned about, which is that uh, uh, we do live in a time where the reliance on visual media uh, in terms of looking at things on the internet, uh, looking at things in terms of auctions, and frankly, art fairs, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the brightest, the shiniest, the most iconic is always gonna do better in those kinds of contexts. And it does skew the, the, the market, and more importantly, it does kind of fuck with artists' head. And I think they're quite aware of it that these kinds of uh, 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 situations, whether it's sort of entertainment-oriented on one hand or consumerist-oriented on the other hand, have a tendency to hold back artists and create levels of production which don't really push the thinking of the work forward and, in case, create product. I'd like ah, to... But, you know, um, Rubens created a lot of product and... And a lot of it still looks like product today. You know, you get a studio with 400 painters, everyone's still going to be going for, I want the early one that you actually painted yourself. So, you know, it's... Let's it's, open it up for some <laughs> questions. There's two mics. If you could raise your hand and say either who you are or if you're an artist or critic or something, identify or somebody standing up or if we could get the mic to you. No. Uh, is that Mary standing up? Oh, who has a question? Somebody in the front. Uh-oh. Press. Uh-oh. Somebody in a tie. No, no. Just a simple question. And it's for both of you. For Josh, it's the $100,000 question. For Paul, the one million. The question is rather easy. You know that we, I'm writing an article for young football players who are becoming wealthy. And now this young football player has 100,000 
or a million that he can lose. And he has in his mind four things. 25 years, he would like to, he would like to get his investment back, 100%. I, I 100 think. years, 200 years, and 1,000 years. Why I'm taking 1,000 years? If you take a giant tree, a sequoia, or an oak tree, it takes 1,000 years to deliver good and sound wood for the craftsman. I, I think we have your point. Uh, well, the good as news is, is your, 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 your fastest number is a number that I would truly appreciate to see more collectors stick to. If people actually said, oh, I'd like to keep this thing for 25 years, they'd actually hold on to more of the good stuff that they bought instead of, quote, you know, selling it because I cannot tell you how many really smart collectors who buy great things somehow feel vindicated when it goes up 10 times in value and whether it takes two years or 10 years or 25 years, they, they, they sell it. And it's like, that's the dumbest thing you can ever do. If like you have something that's great. And I'm glad it's a football player because it made me immediately think that Laura Owens has always had this great fashion. No, no I don't represent Laura Owens with, uh, uh, she's done this whole uh, series of football players and uh, you know, I think everybody should always try to buy art that they can see themselves in because they're gonna love it and live it with it longer and maybe come to appreciate it for something other than its uh, return on investment. I mean, the question, I mean, these are questions, unfortunately, we spend way too much of our time when we're talking and helping people buy art talking about the money. Uh, but not me. I, I don't do. know nothing about this, okay. but he does. But I like to say to somebody who if they said they had that amount of money, it's like, in 25 years, would a museum be happy to get that as a gift? I'm not saying it's worth more or less, but would an important museum like MoCA or SF MoMA or you know, the Albright Knox, if you walked in and said, here you go, no strings attached, would you like this? They go, wow. I think that's a good criteria. And then, I sometimes say to myself, wow, is that going to be in the night, at a million dollars, I'm going to say, wow, is that going to be in the night sale at the auctions in 25 years, or is that going to be so far off the radar that it's going to be invisible? So when you're talking about <clears throat> levels of money, that's kind of the strategies that I talk to people, including football players I know who collect art. Another question? I'm sorry, we did such a bad job answering the last one that it no one It was more wanted. eloquent than our answer. <laughs> Microphone. What are your top three works at the fair? Josh? Uh, you'd have to pay me for that. <laughs> um, top three works at the fair. Well, I'd, actually, I got asked that by uh, Chairman of Christie's because he was doing a talk and he hadn't even been here and he said, you better tell me. So I'm going to say Richard Serra, prop piece on the corner up in Norton Haka. Polka photo, hand painted from the 70s at uh, Michael Werner. Smoking the opium. Yeah, that I was this, a gorgeous. Yeah. Pretty awesome. That was in my retrospective. I had like 11 of those from uh, uh, Kitka. They're, they're, that's not the best from this series. It's We're sort talking of about right an art there. fair. I'm just talking to you. It's like, it's a great one, but it's sort of in the middle of the great ones. Middle of the great ones at an art fair is pretty good. Yeah, well, that's why you should go to the museum. Yeah. <laughs> they got the art. They got the art. And third, I don't know. I'm not going to say. Of ones, one that's not in your booth. Next. Next. Okay. Do we have another question? Comment. Well, that's good. Um, Paul, is there anything you'd like to? There's, some, there's oh, we have way a in the back. There's oh, someone. Somebody. Okay. I'm a bit embarrassed to ask this question. <laughs> well, then oh. don't. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I will though. Uh, um, I'm from Los Angeles. My name is Danielle Villacana, and I live in Italy. And I have a little gallery, and I'm an artist. 
and I've spent half my life in LA and half my life in Italy. And one of the one of the comments I get so often, because it's very difficult to interest the Italian market in collecting, is they're interested in in this point of the value that you mentioned, uh, that that let's say the the necessity that it be worth something. And I always try and can interest them in the, the, the part about being passionate about the artwork and, and loving the artwork. And as you say, wanting to grow with the artwork, seeing yourself in the artwork. Do you have any suggestions of how to, and, and I'm so proud of Los Angeles, I'll say what, what's going on. How, as a gallerist, as a young gallerist, can I help people find the passion to invest in artists? Well, you, you're not going to do this. I don't have the guts to do myself, and I'm 60. I'd like to say to that guy, by the way, I'd like you to tell me a stock to buy. I'd like it to at least double in the next year. And if it doesn't go up, I want you to give me my money back for what I paid for it. And by the way, I don't want to pay you for any of this advice. And you're, any of these investment banker guys will look at you like you're nuts. But that's sort of what they're asking you to do. So you have to sort of deflect the conversation as best you can away from value. I, I, I'm not really sure what the question is, but I got Italy in there someplace. Italy and LA. Yeah. And uh, we've seen a dramatic improvement in somehow uh, 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 Italy being really brought from <laughs> better than San Francisco, but that notion of being loved to death and held at home to a far more uh, uh, global appreciation of uh, aspects of what came out of the 50s with, you know, Burry and Fontana and Manzoni. Look at Prada buying the Keenholz, um masterpiece that was great. installation. That was a great one. Uh, but That's the, LA to the Italy. The, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Italian both uh, uh, 50s conceptualism, I mean, it's extraordinary how long it took for art to povera, maybe that's because they called it poor art instead of pop art, uh, to kind of become more written into the history. But I do think there have been fundamental problems with the Italian market. One, it is kind of a slightly specialized market that they have a tendency to keep the things home, set up foundations, and uh, not sort of spread the word. Uh, sort of as a lender, an institutional lender, it was always very difficult to send things to Italy because of uh, uh, insurance and uh, uh, sort of specialized needs in terms of bond. Italy has not been the easiest place in terms of both uh, 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 the development of museums and, 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 and the resources to do that. Uh, it, it has improved dramatically, and I think the appreciation has improved dramatically, but I think relative to other European kind of French or it, 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 it was not it, it, it was not the most transparent or uh, easily accessible. On the other hand, uh, it, there's probably uh, 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 real improvements that have been made. Uh, Los Angeles didn't have that 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 those kinds of issues uh, and in that respect, uh, uh, Los Angeles, look, Los Angeles has never had, fortunately, the kinds of commercial uh, focus that you see in uh, London or in New York or other great, and, and I think of Los Angeles as a great art capital, but a little bit like I I Italy, it is sort of specialized and uh, it, it certainly has taken that Los Angeles art is being seen sometimes first in Germany or in New York or in uh, uh, Spain before it gets seen in, in, in LA. And that's a very good thing. If, if, you, if you had taken the, the Europeans out of the, 
the, the support and infrastructure for a John Baldessari or a Chris Burden, or even more, you know, recently an artist like Mike Kelly, not so recent, but Mike Kelly was getting more support out of Germany than he was getting, you know, at, at times uh, it, it, from his home. Uh, Think of the, it as an opportunity to bring new information there and that's a good phase to be at with the gallery. I would think, wow, it's like a chance to make a difference for the audience, for yourself, and for artists. And we're, you know, the flow of art and information is easier now. The structure of like that contemporary art is interesting, is bigger in Italy. It's like that's a good place to be, rather than I'd see it that way. Do we have one more question before we have to wrap it up? Thank you. I'm a curator and I've just got a question about the museums and the market. Obviously you've been saying that many more works have been now appreciated. Um, from a market point of view, their prices are going up. Um, if they're museum quality works, then how can the museums actually afford to acquire them when the prices are becoming stratospheric? You know, yesterday, I, I, as a museum person, I'm sure you do this too. You, you, you know, you look at the work and... Uh, when you look at the label, I, I always look at two dates. And, you know, one date is when was it made, and the other date is, like, when was it acquired. And, you know, in looking at the Basel Art Museum, you realize there was a certain moment in time where there was extraordinary resources at the disposal of a very wise curator, and they managed to buy, you know, some really not unknown artists, very well-known artists, and at the time they bought it, the work was certainly uh, very valuable. It wasn't, you know, it, w it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't speculative. Somebody who's 28 years old and is just, you know, the next new thing on the scene. And, you know, I looked at a string of, like, extraordinary uh, sort of late 50s, early 60s uh, abex works, field paintings, and I said, wow, they got the right, you know, curator with the right resources at the time. And I, I, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, has everything to do with uh, uh, being, uh, using all of your intelligence when you're working on shows and you know whether it's a thematic exhibition or it's a monographic exhibition, you get to actually know something. And if you don't have the capacity to enrich the museum with that knowledge at that time, of you know what is of great value and it is overlooked, I'm not saying you should buy the most expensive thing in the show, but something of great value and overlooked, that's where you want to be. That's what you want to use your resources for. You certainly shouldn't be trying to buy against what, you know, uh, uh, the, the most uh, 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 well-funded uh, uh, private foundation in, is is able to do. You're, you know, you're 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 not buying for uh, uh, <clears throat> you. You shouldn't be buying at auctions. <laughs> you should be buying directly from artists. I think our time you is know, up through the galleries. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Got it right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.